Hey everybody, thanks for coming. I'm uh, Josh Harvey from Lama Sioux, and uh, we make uh, these things, Bitcoin H. Um, the point of these things are to take your uh, filthy, worthless government fiat cash and turn it into real money, uh, Bitcoin, of course. This is your phone, which has a Bitcoin wallet on it. QR code machine. Um, now, is my button, and I'll send you nice new shiny bits to your phone. Uh, here, five seconds. Insert, press the button. Boom, got bitcoins on your. Phone. Look at this. Is uh, and this might be familiar to uh, programmers here. Is with a state machine or a finite state machine. Um, so you're starting in the start state where the machine doesn't know anything. Um, and the important part here is, since it's in the start state, you don't want the, to allow the machine to accept cash um, because we need the Bitcoin address to know where to send the money. And if they just start inserting cash, we won't know where to send the Bitcoin. So we don't want to allow Bitcoin, uh, cash to be inserted at this point until we have a Bitcoin address. So the only thing you're allowed to do here with that arrow, uh, you can see where it says scan address, the only thing we're allowed to do at this point is to scan the address. Once we've done that, we are now in the has address state. And now we're allowed to do one other thing. We're not allowed to scan the address anymore because we already have it. Um, we're allowed to insert a single bill. That's the only thing we're allowed to do. So we have another arrow there. And here, we're, we now have a bill and an address. So there are two things we can do. We can either finish up the transaction, send the bitcoins from that one 10 euro bill, or we can keep on inserting more bills. Say we want a little bit more. And then we send the bitcoins. Um, so the important thing about this uh, diagram is it's already restricting what the computer can do. And we see very clearly from this diagram um, that the machine isn't going to do all kinds of bad things that it's not supposed to do. Another way to look at this, though, is with a PetriNet. And in this case, um, you'll see they look very similar. And in fact, they're, they're equivalent. So because of this simple case, you're doing the exact same thing. And um, you've just got these uh, little bars or boxes uh, with the arrows instead of just the arrows. So it's just going to move that token through, just like it's following the arrows. Send, put some cash in, send some coins, and we're done. Uh, you'll notice I showed you this picture, and I didn't show you a picture of our code. Uh, that's because the code isn't very pretty. Uh, you end up with stuff like this, um, stuff that hasn't been uh, touched in a while. It should probably be cleaned up. Um, and another thing you'll notice is that um, you might have been following the diagram before, but you're probably not following what's going on here. And in fact, the person who wrote this code probably isn't following what's going on here after four years. Um, and that's, that's not so good. You see there are like 2,000 lines in this file, and it keeps on going. Um, this was written in a uh, programming language called JavaScript, which was um, invented in 10 days to do stuff like this um, in 1995. And now it's basically running the world. Uh, I think Walmart is actually running on JavaScript. Um, and we're running on JavaScript. I mean, the problem isn't necessarily that JavaScript is a terrible language. It's, it's got its flaws. The problem is uh, the idea of how we write code. Um, and that has to do with something this guy came up with, uh, Ward Cunningham, the guy who invented Wiki. Um, and in 1992, he came up with this term called technical debt. And technical debt is a lot like regular debt in the sense that it's pretty easy to get the debt. Um, you just get a bundle of cash thrown on you, and you can start spending it. That's fun. And the problem with debt is um, eventually you're going to meet a guy like this. <laughs> um, when it comes to code, um, what happens is you just keep on writing code because it's fun. You know, it's fun to write code. You're getting feature requests. You're putting it in there. You're getting things working. 
um, but you're amassing this debt, and the debt means that there are going to be bugs, and you're going to be spending a lot of time finding those bugs, and you're going to be spending a lot of time fixing the bugs and maintaining your code, and then you're going to be writing more code, not fixing how you wrote the original code, and in the end, all you're going to be doing is finding these bugs, fixing the bugs, and you're not going to be able to do the stuff you really want to do. And you're going you're gonna to meet guys like this, and it doesn't feel good. Um, so what do we do? Um, well, maybe the problem is we've been listening to guys like this too much. Um, this is Larry Wall. He created a uh, very popular programming language called Perl. Um, and he says the uh, three chief virtues of a programmer are laziness, impatience, and hubris. Um, maybe we need to start listening to um, a different kind of people who completely overthink a problem before they even care about being useful. Um, basically mathematicians. Uh, and in particular, uh, mathematicians who like to draw. <laughs> Actually, that's a little dark, but... Uh, um, yeah, they are drawing stuff, too. Um, and what we're going to get from, from these mathematicians is to really think out the problem, prove things about what we want to do, and all of this before we even start writing the first line of code. And maybe if we're lucky, we won't even have to write that first line of code. Maybe we'll just be like drawing diagrams, and that'll, that'll be running everything. And that would be pretty nice. Um, so let me, let me get into really quickly uh, what Petri nets are. Um, how many people have seen Petri nets before? All right. Uh, so there are plenty of people who haven't. Um, so this is, a lot of these examples are from the state box monograph because they're really good examples in there and I encourage everybody to look at it. It explains, uh, state box does things in a, in a really strange way. So they have, um, like if they want to teach you category theory, they'll take an entire PhD pro program and cram it into two days <laughs> from like morning to evening. Um, and they actually somehow pulled that off. Um, and then if they want to write a monograph, they'll explain category theory and Petri nets at the same time and like prove how they're the same thing. So um, let's start on the left here. Uh, PetriNet is, you've seen this before in, in, in one of the early slides. It's very much like a state machine, but more powerful. So you've got this thing called the token. And those are the little black dots. Um, you've got a place, which is the circles. The tokens go inside the places. They live in there. Um, you have the transition. And the transition is what gets you from those uh, places on the left, the diagram on the left to the diagram on the right. Um, and you'll see this uh, arrow over here, this little upside down triangle, is signifying that the transition has just fired and we've moved from that state to this state. Um, then you have the uh, arrows here. And um, you'll see they, in, at first they didn't have numbers, so when you see an arrow without a number, that's really just an arrow with a one. So just pretend there's a one there. Um, so let's see how this works. We start off with the, uh, the first uh, place here. It's got one token. And after firing, since there's an arrow going from the token to the uh, transition, it's going to take one token out of that place. And that's, you see that's what it does. One minus one is zero. So you've got an empty place there. Next one, you got two tokens, um, another arrow without a one, but it's really a one. So it's two minus one. You've got one token there. And this guy's got three tokens. There is a number there. So it's taking three tokens out of that place. So that's going to be three minus three. It's going to be empty. And then what happens on the other side? So the, this is a little strange, because you would think that like all the tokens, uh, the same number of tokens go from through the transition out to the other side, but that's not what happens. Um, what happens is these, these arrows here on the right tell you how many tokens have come out, and that could be a different number. So we forget about the tokens that went in. And uh, now we see a, an arrow here um, that doesn't have a number, so that's a one. So that's going from the empty place to place with one token. And then we're going from the place with three tokens, another arrow without a number, so that's one. Three plus one is four. And we get that place. So we basically transformed the uh, tokens on that side to the tokens on this side through this transition. Uh, does that make sense? Any questions? OK, cool. 
All right, so uh, we explained what Petri nits are, but, but what do we actually want from all this stuff? You know, what are we looking for? Um, what are we looking for to make our life easier as programmers, to make our products better? Um, the first thing that we want is this visual flow. So you saw our code, and um, visual flow gives you a lot. As a programmer, it gives you a lot because you can immediately see what's going on in the program. You can understand it. If you drew something like this and you came back four years later, you would still understand what's going on. Uh, if you're looking at 2,000 lines of code that you wrote four years ago, um, you're going to be very lost and you're going to have to spend days just trying to figure out what's going on there and why you did the crazy things you did four years ago. Um, the other thing is it's great for other people in your organization or your team who aren't programmers. They can go to something like this and understand what the flow is and they can tell you, hey, this isn't supposed to work with this way, you know, our supplier doesn't do that, uh, our customer doesn't like that, and you, gotta, you have to move this circle over here, and they can actually participate in this process. And then the third thing is, once you've done this process, you may not even have to go to a, a coder to like code it up into a program. You can just take this and maybe run it on the computer. Um, another thing we want is something called liveness guarantees, and this is getting a little more technical. Uh, this is also from the monograph. Um, and mono, uh, liveness means that our, our code can never get into a state where it's stuck forever. It's called a deadlock situation. And um, it's sometimes not so obvious. So if you, you see this um, transition T2 on the bottom here, and there is a token in P2, so there's no problem. Oh, there's one thing I forgot to tell you. If there aren't enough tokens in that place uh, for the transition to fire, so let's say if there was zero tokens in P2, and T2 needs one because it's that arrow without the one, um, it can't fire at all. It's got to wait until there's a token in there. So, but in this case, there's no problem. We've got a token in P2. T2 can fire. It's going to go back to P1. Uh, T1 is going to be fine. It's going to go around to P2 again, and uh, everything is good. So here it is in action. Two tokens there, boom, goes back out, down there, goes T2 again, and T2, whoop. All right, now it's stopped. Why did it stop? It stopped because it's in a deadlock and it's, it's never going to come back to life. It's like, you know, fatal heart attack. Um, and th that wasn't obvious just looking at it. So what we, want, we want the computer to tell us, hey, your code's going to have a deadlock somewhere or everything is cool, you're not going to have any deadlocks. And for this kind of Petri net, there, there are certain classes of Petri nets where you can actually say that. And that's a really great feature to have. Another thing we want is something called a halting guarantee. Um, and this is a similar problem where you can get stuck in this loop and just keep on going around forever and you're never going to get to your goal, which is P3. You're just going to go around the merry-go-round merry forever. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a big problem because in code like JavaScript, um, there's actually a known result that you can't prove that your program doesn't have stuff like that in a general sense. Um, but with PetriNets, uh, we do have a chance of doing that. So that's another great thing about uh, uh, Petri nets. Reachability guarantees. Uh, so this is modeling uh, two traffic lights in a busy intersection. The guy on the left is a green light and a red light. The green light is the, uh, the green circle, the red light is the red circle, and then you have another traffic light uh, on the other side of the intersection. And this is a state that we don't want because we've got two green lights, um, so you've got two cars, they both have green lights, uh, you, you know what's going to happen next. It's not pretty. Um, so we can tell, let's say, our analysis program, hey, listen, um, you know, our experts in, in, in traffic lights have told us that this is a state that they don't want. Um, can, you, can you make sure that that's not in my program? And there are ways to do that. So you, there are Petri nets you can run, you can run analysis on them, and they'll tell you this can never happen. So that's, that's also a really great thing, especially when you're dealing with train systems, cars, Bitcoin ATMs where you don't want to double spend and like keep on dispensing money to one guy and stuff like that. Uh, concurrency. So in the real world, uh, there are a lot of things happening at once, right? Things don't, aren't in, like, in this one neat program flow. Um, we want to be able to model that so that we can work with that. And um, the state boxes I originally showed you, those simple things in the beginning, they can't really do concurrency. And that's why we, we need the extra richness and complexity of Petri nets. And 
And then we can, that can help us a lot with this real world, world concurrency where different things are happening at the same time. Okay, this is, this is important and it's not uh, exactly obvious from the beginning, um, but we want something called composition. And what that means is we want to be able to take, build up small pieces like these Lego blocks, fit them together to a bigger piece, and then we want to know that that big piece isn't going to behave in weird ways just because we put those little pieces together. So we're working on all these little pieces because it's too daunting and too hard to work on the, the whole thing at once. But what happens if you start putting those little pieces together and all of a sudden this weird behavior comes out that wasn't coming out in any of the little pieces? So we want to make sure that when we put the pieces together, everything is going to stay sane. Uh, sorry, not that kind of execution. Um, this, we, another thing we want to do is, and I uh, talked about this a bit before, is we want to make sure that the Petri nets um, can execute, they can actually fulfill their role in life without me having to look at this pretty diagram on the, on the wall and start coding it into some JavaScript program. We want to just feed this into the computer, run it, and let it take care of uh, what it's supposed to do. And this is pretty cool. So um, just in the past few days, Statebox has uh, come up with this, uh, with this code that lets you dump in a Petri net. It is actually running in the browser in JavaScript. Um, and it just takes the, uh, the Petri net and, and executes it for you. So this is something you can already start doing. And the, the tough part is we want all of these things together all the time at the same time, and we don't, we don't really want to uh, compromise on any of these things. Um, and that's kind of why we need the, uh, the mathematicians. So this is, these are, this is actually open research uh, right now is going into all these questions of, you know, when do you get all these different properties? Um, there, there are uh, papers that are just coming out, you know, a few weeks ago. And um, in fact, um, at least uh, two of the authors of these papers are right here in the audience now, Jade and Pavel. Um, and uh, they were also at the, uh, all three of them were at the workshop. So that, that kind of shows you how, how cool Statebox is. Um, they're working on all these things right now, and, and we know how to do a lot of this stuff already, at least for certain simple uh, cases, which may be enough to do like everything we need in the, in the Bitcoin ETF. All right, so let me get into a little bit more about what uh, Petri nets mean. How am I doing on the time, by the way? Let's do it. still have 15, 20 minutes. Okay, good. Um, so let, let's talk about, we, we saw how it works. Let's see um, what, it, what it really means. Um, this is something we have to do when we're building the, the ATMs. We take a piece of uh, sheet metal, just a sheet of metal, um, and then we need to turn it, let's say, into a, a door of the ATM so they have this huge machine that will uh, bend the steel in just the right way to get a nice, nice looking door. Um, so what this does is you can think of the place as the type, the, the token is the resource, so in this case it's the sheet of steel, and then the place tells you what kind of resource that token is. Uh, we start off with the uh, resource being sheet metal, but once we do this bend operation, it's going to morph into an ATM door. Now, it's important that we moved it from the sheet metal to the ATM door because we don't have that sheet metal anymore. It's now a door, so we can't have both at the same time. So this is, this is kind of describing what just happened with the sheet metal and the door. Um, and so if you look back at our simple example of how the ATM works, um, it's a little more uh, subtle to figure out what these places are talking about. But one way to look at it is uh, you could say that they're describing the physical screen on the ATM. And the physical, you only have one physical screen, right? You only have uh, one screen. You don't have these like five different screens that you can put stuff on. Um, the places, these circles, are telling you which screen you're on. So the token can only be in one of them at any given time. Um, but I lied. Our Bitcoin ATM doesn't really look like that. It's not simple. Um, you start dealing with these massive nets because in the real world, things get messy. 
and you have jams in the uh, cash validator, you have people putting in uh, dollar notes instead of euro notes, you have people trying to yank out the bill as it's going in, uh, you have communication errors, the Wi-Fi goes down. There are all kinds of things that happen, and, and you have to put all of that into these Petri nodes. You can't forget anything when you're, when you're telling a computer what to do, because they're not smart enough yet to figure things out on their own. So if they, you don't tell them exactly what to do in every single situation, uh, you're going to have trouble. Uh, that's another nice thing about Petri nets is it's a, when you're uh, designing these things, it's a lot easier to see that you're missing some important state. When you're coding, it's very easy to just forget about or get lazy, which is one of the chief virtues of a programmer. Um, so we're told. But it's very easy to get lazy and, and not deal with all the cases. And here it kind of forces you to do that a little bit more. Um, but this isn't even it because um, see this transition here? We're going to zoom in there a little bit. That's not just a regular transition. This actually zooms out into a uh, entirely new net that like, lives in this one. We were talking about composition. And that's what we're trying to do here. So that actually is like lives in that parent net. And uh, this thing is just handling a single bill going in and out. So a uh, guy puts in a bill, it runs this whole thing. And then when it's finished with that, it goes back up to the other one. But that's not it even, even it, because um, I'll just see this run a little bit. That's not even it, because you have this little guy over here, which turns into this. This is thanks to uh, government regulations, which um, it's called AML KYC, anti-money laundering, spy on your customer. Um, and they basically want you to find out everything about your customer and save it forever. So, uh, you know. So they have complete control of the uh, financial system. Um, but that's not either, because now we need to um, figure out what kind of AML KYC we have to do. Um, then let's say we decide we need to do phone SMS AML KYC. We have to start going through this thing. And part of that is um, that we need to ask for a security code, deal with security code, but the user is going to put the security code in wrong, so then we're going to have to ask for it again, and, and yeah. Uh, that's, that's pretty much the end of this uh, code flow right here, um, but there's more. Uh, so this is, okay, we're shifting gears here a little bit. Before we were talking about um, user interface, UI, uh, dealing with the customer who's front, in front of the machine, but there's other stuff that has to go on, and that's dealing with the hardware, the stuff that actually sucks in the uh, banknotes and tells us uh, you know, that we're not dealing with counterfeit notes or uh, euro notes or uh, Japanese uh, notes or anything else. So um, this thing is the JCMI vision. They sell millions of these to casinos all around the world. Um, and this is modeling basically the conversation between that hardware device and the computer program we're running. The cool thing is, this is a page from the manual from that device, the technical manual. And this is telling you how to program this device. So on the left, you see the controller. That's the computer. On the right, you have the acceptor. That's the hardware device. So it starts off the, uh, you're on the left side of the arrow. So the, the computer has uh, control and sending messages, sending messages. The, uh, we get to power up the hardware module uh, woke up, so it's telling us that it woke up, then we're telling it, you know, telling what version you are, um, <coughs> initialize yourself, do all this other stuff, and it's going back and forth, and that tells you how to program this. Usually, you would take this and start writing JavaScript code, uh, or C code, but we can model this. This is pretty much the same diagram, like one for one, just copying this, um, except that we've added some more uh, Petri nets here, we've added the user, but it's still, just going, we basically split up the PC into some different uh, pieces, but it's just talking back and forth. And the really cool thing is we can overlay our Petri net that we saw before, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these arrows and the transition arrows. This is basically um, describing one possible path you can go through. So in this case, let's say it's a successful um, startup and uh, we're ready to get a bill. But of course, there are other paths, like uh, there's a jam, a note jammed in the machine. And that would just be a different page of this uh, manual. And what we can do is we can feed all those manual pages into our uh, analysis program, 
and make sure that our Petri nets are going according to the manual. So that's another really cool thing about this. Um, okay, so we're still not finished. I've showed you all these guys in yellow here. Um, you've seen all those, but there are all these guys that uh, I haven't even shown you yet. But since there are other speakers and you know we want to do other things today, I'll save that for another time. That's basically dealing with, uh, so this one is just selecting what kind of transaction we're going to do. And I showed you about uh, cash in, but uh, I didn't show you these other two guys, uh, which are cash out and redeem. And cash out is if for some reason you want to get rid of your Bitcoin and get your filthy fiat bank notes back, uh, you can do that. And if you do do that, you might have to go to a redeem situation where we'll give you a code and you'll have to come back later and wait for the Bitcoins to confirm. Um, and then you're going to have Petri nets here that I'm not going to show you, but they're even nastier and more complicated than the ones I already did show you. Um, so I know what you're thinking now. Um, these Petri nets are really complicated. They're huge. You're crazy. Why are you using Petri nets for this? You know, it, it doesn't seem like it's that simple. Um, and my answer to that is that complexity, I believe, is, is really in the real world. Like, that's, that's the problem domain. Um, these machines will get jammed. Users are going to do crazy things. Um, Wi-Fi networks are going to go down. Um, bad stuff is going to happen. That has to be somewhere in your program or the computer is not going to be able to uh, handle it. Um, so you can either put it in, in these nice, neat Petri nets um, that fit together really nicely. You can prove all kinds of things about them, and you can throw them right on the computer to run. Or you can take all of those things, um, hire a coder for a ton of money, and tell them, uh, just write some JavaScript code and, and, and you know, model all this in your JavaScript code. And, and we'll do a few tests to, to see that the transactions like, seem to work. And, and then we'll throw it out to the world, which is basically what we're doing now. Um, and uh, you know, when I think about that, I just uh, I don't get a good feeling. So <laughs> the moral of the story is um, is that we think you want to use Petri nets, and we think this is going to revolutionize programming. This is from the state box monograph. So I think my uh, my uh, work here is done. Showed you some not very small nets. Uh, thanks, everybody. <laughs> any uh, questions? Do we have any time for? Yeah, yeah we can take some questions. Yeah. I may have missed this because I was late, but from a formal standpoint, what's the connection between Petronets and um, FRP? FRP? Functional um, Well, that's a good question. I didn't really talk about that. but. Um, we're not actually even using uh, functional relational programming that much. Um, and um, I mean, are you, are you talking about functional relational programming? Like reactive, reactive. Ah, reactive? Yeah. So what, can you give me an example of that? An example? Yeah. Um, so you encode your state as a signal, and then you have functions on the state which send events, generating new signals, and uh, you describe your state transformation Okay, um, other than, uh, than the Petri nets I was talking about, um, I don't really have an answer to that. Yeah, but uh, maybe yeah. <laughs> sure. So FRP is one of these things that you can do with this. If you think of a net as describing the state of your UI, and this is what we'll be doing as well with the APMs, um, the token describing which, which uh, screen you're showing, you can think of the net as a stream that just sends out state. And there's another stream going back in that tells you which transitions to fire. So it fits actually very neatly with uh, functional reactive programming. Also, the whole thing is type and compositional, meaning that we should be able to compose these things. So at some point, you're going to get some sort of UI where you simply drag functions or stream, um, like transformers on top of each other, and you get uh, your UI very cleanly. So it's, it's very well suited for this kind of stuff, and one of the things we'll be going into. model a logic of resources so every time you reason in terms of resources so you want to put uh, guarantees on how you're going to consume things or if you're going to copy them or if you're going to destroy them you can do this with Petronets 
So if you reason in terms of signals going around, and you want stuff like if I send a message, this message has to you know get delivered only once and consumed or copied or whatever, that you can do with patterns very easily. It's uh, technically these are basically encode a fragment of linear logic, and if you know linear logic, you should be happy. <laughs> Here, uh, take the mic. Okay. Okay, there's also a framework um, uh, called PetroNet, and um, there on the ARCs you have um, ML expressions, and the tokens are not just tokens, they are um, expressions like, um, I don't know, a list or um, a pair, this kind of stuff, and you have also this whole type thing included. It, we are, I'm very uh, aware with CPM tools. The CPM tools is actually one of the reasons why I wanted to write my own tooling. Uh, uh, the, 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 the model of code petronets is, is way too powerful. So once you have these um, like full-blown ML expressions on it, it becomes very hard to give any of these, these proofs. I'm not saying that it cannot be done, but um, we start by simpler stuff and trying to uh, preserve the, the properties to automatically prove them and then slowly add stuff. So that the goal would be at some point to basically rebuild CPM, but now uh, categorically founded. Uh, yeah. yeah, we are working on the categorical semantics of it anyway. So, so uh, yeah, I came up on stage to uh, tell you about the break that we're going to have now. So we're going to have a 15 minute break. Uh, then we're going to have a talk by uh, Stefano and by Katz Tickets. That's the next session. Uh, so yeah, we're looking forward to it.